Perhaps you have seen uh, the uh, Captain America series. It's spiritual, is it not? Uh, now, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, if you're watching a movie like this, just tell your wife, your kids, I'm watching it because the pastor said you can find theological stuff in things, right? <laughs> just trying to help you. Uh, amen. Thank you. Amen. Uh, this is a spiritual experience watching Captain America because uh, if you watch the very first one, there's a, the Captain America, Steve Rogers, he goes into this machine put together by the army. It's like a chamber. It's got a window on it and it takes a special serum because they want to make him into the ultimate military fighting machine in World War II to take on the German uh, SS Science Corps uh, to take on Hive, this deity of theirs. And so he wa they want to use him to battle evil. Uh, and so uh, Steve Rogers steps into this uh, chamber but he's a little scrawny guy. Have you seen the movie? How many have seen the movie? Oh, good. I'm not giving away anything. So he steps in there, and he's just like this little scrawny guy. And, it, you know, the, the machine's blazing light and everything and smoke coming out of it. And he's screaming, and they, they almost stop the machine. He says, don't stop it. You know, let it go. And so when they open it, radical difference in what he looks like when he, you know what I'm saying? He, he goes in a little skinny guy, and then he comes out looking like what Schwarzenegger used to look like back in the day. You know what I'm saying? This, this. And if you don't know who Schwarzenegger is, I can't help you. I, did, I don't. Somebody there didn't. Even, they didn't even know who Clint Eastwood is. Make my day. I mean, you don't know. Aging is a weird thing. But anyway, back to my sermon. What's that got to do with anything? Well, the whole project that he's working for is called Project Rebirth. Oh, interesting. Because he's reborn, little skinny guy goes in for the military, comes out the other side, this hulk of a man, uh, rippling muscle, got a shield to def uh, deflect the enemy's blows, etc., uh, to take on evil itself. It's amazing. Uh, but it took faith for him to step into that machine, right? Right. Now, what I, when I'm watching that show, I'm thinking to myself, this has got nothing on God. See, oh, now you, I'm connecting the dots. I see where he's going. He's got nothing on God. Because if you take God's salvation machine and you step into it, just go with it. Just, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now, something just hit you that's funny. Chris, you're my friend. Come on. You step into God's salvation chamber, right? You go in by faith, right? Right, I know you've been in there. And you go in by faith because you believe the evidence is true that he's the son of God. He died for your sins and you're a sinner and you need him. So you step in. You go in. That, you, the thing is, you might go in spiritually, uh, physically alive, but you're spiritually dead. dead. So uh, you're probably about to get a Christmas tree here pretty soon. Christmas tree looks fantastic. It's green. It's beautiful if you buy, a, you know, the real thing. Um, but if it's in your living room, like, say, March, like some people in my neighborhood, it's like... Don't you drive by? Their lights are still on. You know, it's like weird. It's dead at that point, is it not? Right. So it looked alive, like in December, but it's got no roots. It's dead. So that's the way we are spiritually. So you might go into God's salvation chamber, just go with it, and you go in by faith, but you're spiritually dead, but you come out spiritually alive. That's way beyond Captain America. Do you know what I'm saying? He goes in alive. He comes out alive. In God's machine, you go in dead, you come out alive. For eternity. I'm going with that one. What's it got to do with anything? What's about transformation? Spiritual transformation. You can't even watch sci-fi without them bringing that motif in there. Now to switch to another gear, you could go to the Transformers. They actually use the word. <laughs> I'm just saying. They're getting this from the Bible. Uh, Paul talks about the transforming nature of God's spiritual salvation chamber in Ephesians 2. We'll go there for just a minute. Ephesians 2. Notice what Paul says. Now, grammar means everything. Because the grammar's inspired. So why God picked what he picked, the words that he picked, the tenses he picked, totally important. It's all important. What does God say to the Ephesian believers? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins when you didn't know Christ as your Savior. When you hadn't stepped into the chamber to be saved. Uh, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince and the power of the air, which is Satan. Satan. He controls this place. This is his domain. Uh, in, uh, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You used to be dead in your sins. Uh, he was like the puppet master. And you, you just followed your own desires. In fact, he's basically saying what our culture probably needs to hear. You're, you're taking your desires and fulfilling them and calling that righteous. And he says in verse 3, And among them we too all formerly, past tense, lived in the lust of our flesh. And what did we do? We indulge in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath against sin. Even as the rest. That's the way we used to be dead, spiritually. 
Notice the next verse. Verse 4. What's the first word? But. but. What's but state rhetorically, grammatically? B-U-T. It's a contrast. It's a contrast. Now, the very first the word here in the Greek text is ha, or it's ha theos, the God. So the word but comes after ha and then but and then theos. So it, it's really emphasizing God, but God. What God do? Well, what does it say? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, he did this contrastive thing. What did he do? Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us, see the transformation? Alive together with Christ. And then he throws in par- uh, uh, parenthetically, oh yeah, don't forget, by grace you're saved. You have been saved. I mean, it's a done deal. I mean, w- what happened this week? 500 years of Remembering the, the Reformation with Martin Luther, you know? And what a great name, Martin. <laughs> I'm just saying. I asked my mom so many times growing up, well, what were the name choices when you were picking the names for kids? You know, well, I wanted to go with Scott. Oh, wow, I'd have loved that name. Why'd you pick Martin? And then one day, I, when I got into etymology, I looked up the name Martin. It means warrior. Okay, I'm going with that. I don't know what Scott means. We'll pray for you, whatever that name is. But, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just how God works. He, he, he says to Martin Luther, hey, nail those 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg. Why? Because you're saved not by faith in God plus all your many works. You're saved by grace. That's how the person goes from death to life. Paul's been talking to the Romans and telling them, hey, I want to come talk to you as a church. You know, and let me send you my credentials. Here are my credentials. And he's going to give them those credentials. And part of those credentials, he's going to be talking about that grace and that gospel and salvation. But we want to stop and have a test. That's what we do. I'm going to individually call on you today. Something totally new. You're freaking out. (laughs) No, I'm not. Don't worry. What are his credentials so far? He's given three. First credential is? He's a what? He's a servant. He's a servant. He's a bond servant. I'm not in this for the money. I don't want to become famous. I just serve God humbly and with my life. Second thing, he's an apostle, apostolos. He's a sent one. Uh, And his mission is for God. Whatever God wants me to do, that's what I go do. That uh, is applicable to us as well. Third thing, he's set apart for the gospel, which we've been termed as a purveyor. He's a purveyor of the gospel that he's set apart for. So he said, if I come to your church and talk to you, what what do I do? (laughs) I talk about the gospel. I mean, have you read Acts? When you look at Acts, when Paul gets saved around, you know, when you start in chapter 7, verse 58, and keep reading, when he gets saved, if you drop Paul, this converted rabbinical, pharisaical Jew, trained by Gamaliel, and you drop him in a Jewish synagogue on Shabbat, you know, Friday evening, say around 7 o'clock, does he just sit there quietly? Uh, No. He starts talking to all of his friends, because they know he's a rabbinical scholar. Hey, have you ever considered all the prophecies of the Messiah? Huh? They're all throughout the Old Testament. I found the Messiah. How'd that go over for him? Read Acts. Say, well, sometimes they didn't like him, and sometimes they listened to him. Many Jewish people traded and came based on the evidence he given. But he's constantly talking about the gospel. If you drop him in a, like a Grecian temple where they're worshiping a, a pagan uh, goddess, uh, and they're all chanting, basically, we love our goddess, death to Paul, what's he want to do? He, he wants to walk out into the middle of the arena with per- perfect acoustics and give them the gospel. I mean, the guy is gutsy be- because he's been transformed. I mean, he went into the chamber dead, came out alive on Damascus Road. He says, this is what I talk about if I come to your church. I talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ that has redeemed me. I have to stop for just a second. If, you, if you're a believer and you've been transformed, you should talk about the transformation. I mean, it should be part of your conversation. If you have never talked about it, I am just totally quiet. It's either sin or you're not saved. Because if you're saved and you've been transformed, it pulsates in your body. Now, back to my sermon. It's his chamber. He says, I went in and he totally transformed me. So when Paul says, I'm going to come to your church and be a purveyor of the gospel, he's going to add one more verse to talk about it. That's verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3 is more information on the purveyance of the gospel. He's going to purvey that. And we want to talk about the fact, we want to make it personal. We are purveyors of the gospel. How do I know that? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The last words of Jesus before he ascended were, you shall be my witnesses, my martus in Greek, 
Where? Well, in Judea, Samaria, etc. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. His last words were for us to be purveyors of the gospel. So when Paul says, I'm going to come to your church, I'd like to come, let me give you more information about the power of the gospel that's transformed me. He's, he's, he's talking more about it in verse 3, where he's going to list two things. Now, if you look at verse 3, which we're going to do, he's going to introduce us to the first concept uh, about that gospel of Christ. He, he's going to start out with what we would call as a prepositional phrase. Uh, and he's going to talk about the person of the gospel uh, before he looks at the purpose of the gospel in this verse. We want to first look at the, the gospel we're supposed to present because it's about the person, all right? But we want to go back and read what he says about this uh, all at one time because it's one long sentence in Greek. So let's go back uh, and look at verses 1 to 3 to set the context. If we could see that verse. God will make it appear in just a minute. That one. So let's go back. So one long sentence in Greek. What's Paul say? Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he, God, promised through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures, i.e. the Old Testament. And now the prepositional phrase, well, this gospel is concerning him, uh, his son, uh, who was born of the descendant of David according to the flesh. That's the purpose of it. It's related to David, the, the kingdom of David. We'll get into that in just a minute. But the, he, this is how he begins. He said, I got to give you more information about the gospel. So he starts out with this, this prepositional phrase, which when you look at it uh, grammatically, it can only be classified in a, in a causal kind of way. So what that means is, when I'm looking at this from a hermeneutic perspective, I got to take the causal nature of verse 3 based on the preposition concerning and go back up to the next, the verse before it to pick up the motif, the idea. Well, what does that mean? He's telling you the reason why God foretold through the prophets for thousands of years his gospel's coming was so that he could tell you specifically who's coming. That's verse 3. The person who's coming to the gospel is who? What does he say? Who's coming? His son. His son. Let's analyze this for just a minute. Uh, this could be translated literally. Did my pen just bite the dust? Okay, no. Okay, th this, is the, this is the article, the son of him. So, the son of him. This is how you'd read it just literally. But to put it into colloquial English, you've got to take out the article, the, and just make it his son. Well, what does that mean? He's telling you, for thousands of years, God told you specifically who's coming, the person. They all knew who was coming. Well, it's the son of God. Now, this is interesting. He says, the son. He doesn't say a son. Because there's an article there. The article is the letter. There's the word the. The son is coming. Not a son. Had he left it indefinite, well, it could be just about anybody. And then he also, with this genitive over here, of, uh, puts the genitive over here after the, the son to make it totally emphatic. This is the son of God exclamation point. Everybody should have known that the son of God was coming. That's what he says in the grammar. Now, my mother, God love her, she's, <laughs> my mom's like a systems kind of thinker, you know? And so when I was in high school, I, I was always talking to cult people and stuff. And, and so she, she gave me this matrix. It's a DC kind of thing when I was in California. It's a matrix. And this matrix, it's double-sided. I don't even know if they make this any, anymore. It's called the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 1 John 4, 6, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits because there's truth and there's error, spiritually speaking. So my mom said, you know, kind of take this with you, carry it around. I use this for years uh, in talking to friends because like, what is, what is my uh, friend who's uh, into theosophy, what do they think about the Holy Spirit? And it's, it's all categorized here. It's awesome. No, I will not sell it to you. And, and I don't know if it's around anymore, but it is around. Awesome. So get yourself a copy. Um, when you go reading through here, like what the different uh, religions teach about this phrase here, the Son of God, they're messed up because they deviate from what Paul says. It's not the Son, it's, well, let's read, uh, let's go back to uh, some of my family are Jehovah's Witnesses, as I told you last week. Well, what do they say about Jesus? Uh, here's what they read um, from their writings. Quote, Jesus Christ is a created individual, is the second greatest personage of the universe, the first and the only direct creation by the Father Jehovah, appointed by, uh, as his vindicator and the chief agent of life toward mankind. He was born as a human of God, uh, and he became the Messiah seed at the fall. Uh, he died on a stake as a ransomer in the spring of AD 33, blah, blah, blah. Jesus is a created, 
well, kind of quasi-God. He's not God, Jehovah. He's a God. Whenever they come to my door and they ask all their questions, I just turn the conversation around and tell them, I just really want to talk about one thing today. And they're like, what? Well, that Jesus is Jehovah because he says he is. Because this is what Paul says. He's the son of God, not a son of God. Mormons, what do they say about Jesus? They say Jesus uh, Christ is Jehovah, the firstborn among the spirit children of Elohim, to whom all others are juniors. He's unique in that he is the offspring of his mortal mother and of an immortal or resurrected and glorified father. What? Uh, He is the executive of the father, Elohim, uh, in the work of creation. This is interesting. He is greater than the Holy Spirit, which is subject to him, but his father is greater than he is. What? I I thought thought the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were all co-equal as God. But again, again, you can go through the matrix and begin to read on and on and on. People are all confused in their religious understandings of things based on false prophecies about that whole statement, the Son of God. That's looking at it grammatically, who was going to come. Who was going to come over thousands of years? Who did God say? When I send the Savior, it will be my very Son. We've looked at it grammatically. Now we want to look at it philosophically. Are you with me? Philosophically. Well, what's there to look at? A whole lot. We are, by definition, a dependent being. Totally dependent. There's no way you can get around it. You're, man, are you married? <laughs> yeah, who, who are you dependent on? You're not going to say? I'm trying to help you right now. Yeah. You, got, you don't know? You're dependent on her. What does she do for you? You're so quiet now, all of a sudden. Uh, are you married? Who are you dependent on? You guys don't even know? Yeah. You know, I, I, my wife, she, she does wonderful things for me. I mean, I've been married 37 years. It's been awesome. Um, and she's dependent on me, and it, it's a symbiotic relationship. But we are, by definition, dependent on everything for existence. Air, right? I mean, what else? Food. Food. Water, electricity, you name it, gravity, etc. We're dependent. We can't get away from dependence. Now, hold that in your brain because we're totally dependent. All right? We're also potential because there was a time when we weren't, right? Remember? Well, you can't remember. There was a time when you weren't. Yeah, you were only a potential being. That's all you are. You're actualized because you're sitting in a chair. You're actualized, but you're only potential. How'd you get actualized? How'd you go from zero nothingness to something. Did you cause yourself? No, no, no. That was my mom and my dad. They brought me into actualization from potentiality. Oh, how'd they get to actualization themselves? Oh, same thing. And since in law of infinite regress and philosophy, you can't go back and cause effect to infinity because there's no such thing as an effect that creates itself. I mean, even though your dad might've said, I made myself. He, He can't. It's impossible. He's an independent being. By definition, it tells you there has to be a God. There has to be a God who created all of this, who's outside of cause and effect, who made it all. See, science is great. I love science growing up. Zoology, biology, physics. I studied all that stuff. But they can't answer lots of questions like, why is there something rather than nothing? And why is the something that's here highly complex, specified so? And it's irreducible in its complexity. How'd that happen by chance? But anyway, back to my sermon. See, there is a God. He said, I'm going to send my son, who's God. He's coming. Now, we want to look at it theologically. God says, my son's coming. Did he say that in the Old Testament? I mean, did he say that? Well, yeah, sure he did. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. What did he say? He tells the wicked king. He gives him a prophecy, Isaiah does. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, a whopper of a sign. Behold, a virgin, sometime in Jewish history, will be born with a child and she'll bear a son. Uh, Who should I be looking for exactly? What's he say? His name's going to be Emmanuel. God with us is coming. They knew 695 years before he showed up in 5 BC, they knew God was coming, or they should have known. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, skip skip over two chapters. Great messianic passage. Applies to the Messiah. What does he say here? 695 years before Jesus came. For a child will be born unto us, a son will be given to us, the government, the government of David, will rest on his shoulders, and uh, what's his name? Oh, he's got more than one name. What's his first name? Wonderful Counselor. Now, in some Hebrew texts, you divide that into two words, but let's just go with it being Wonderful Counselor. You know, counselors today are about, I don't know, between $90 to $150 an hour. What's Jesus charge? 
I'm just asking. Zero. I mean, he is a wonderful counselor. I mean, you, if you've ever been to a counselor, a lot of it has to do with uh, chemistry. And you kind of bounce around. It's like, I just don't relate to them, you know. And, and it, all they did was sit and stare me down and take notes and didn't say anything, you know. Finally went to the, oh, they're so great. They're fantastic. When you go to Jesus, it's always wonderful. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the Messiah. He's also mighty, mighty God. He's God. He's the Gibor. He's the mighty warrior God. He's, he's powerful. And oh, by the way, he says, uh, he's also eternal. oh eternal father. And he's shalom. He's prince of peace. And thinking minds want to know, how in the world can Jesus be called the eternal father in a messianic passage? Well, uh, because he's not saying that he is the father himself, because he's the second person of the Trinity. He's talking about, in an idiomatic way, uh, his fatherliness. He's eternal like a father. If you know him and you walk with him, you can shake your head in agreement that indeed he is just like a father to you, is he not? That he comes alongside you, and you can't even explain the mystical side of the faith. I'm all for thinking, but you cannot explain the mystical side of the faith when the Lord comes alongside you, and you just know he's with you, and that's your father. At moments of great triumph or great tragedy, he's the father. Friday, I sent my dissertation in, 411 pages. I hit the send button. The father was with me. Oh, God, help me. Bing! You know? Uh, we had the staff in my office celebrating as I hit the go button. Uh, now, no telling what's going to happen, but I, you know, I got over that hurdle. Uh, it, was he with me? Sure he was. Uh, nine years ago when I came here and my earthly father died of cancer, brain cancer, I'm glad God took him because I told my mom it was breaking my heart watching my dad suffer the way he was suffering. But how perfect is the plan of God that he takes my dad, I can do his funeral, and then I can drive here because I couldn't have done it 3,000 miles away. Isn't God perfect? Why? He's the father. He knows perfectly a while what you need. Now when I miss my earthly father, I have great hope that he's with my heavenly father, so he fathers me even now. God's great. God said, I'm coming, and I'm sending my son, and he's every bit deity from the beginning to the end. And then in Micah chapter 5 verse 2, he actually, well, he actually tells you where he's going to be born, doesn't he? Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Have you read that? Have we done it at Christmas Eve? But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From one, from you, one will go forth uh, to me to be the ruler of Israel. Who is he? Well, his goings forth when he comes are from long ago. How long ago? Well, from the days of eternity. He's outside of time and space. What did Jesus say about himself when he showed up? Uh, this is what he said. Uh, when you read about Jesus, um, John chapter 8, verse 58, I would love to have been there for this verbal exchange. You know, those people that tell me, you know, Jesus never called himself God. Then you have never read what Jesus said. Because that's exactly what he says there. When they asked him, who are you? I mean, apart from miraculous activity, which would convince anybody, you think, they still didn't believe. They get to chapter 8, and they're like, who are you? What's he say? It's kind of comical. Truly, truly, if anything's true, I say this to you. Before Abraham was born... Uh, I am. I am. How long had Abraham been dead? Well, let's just say this is around 31, 32 B.C. Abraham, we're talking, I don't know, 2200, 2300 B.C. It's been a while. If you have a 30-year-old guy telling you, yeah, before Father Abraham walked the planet, I was. What would you probably be doing at that point? Hey, we've got some numbers he needs to call. A wonderful counselor. You know, I mean, this guy's this guy's screw loose. He thinks he's, he was before Abraham. He, huh? And how he does it is most interesting. Uh, he uses the first person uh, the pronoun, singular, I. And he weds it to the first person verb to be, I am. He says, I, I am, two times, totally emphatic. Because he wanted to make sure they understood what? He's the I am. Who else said that in the Bible? God himself. A long time ago, I took my, uh, uh, I have this uh, Hebrew uh, concordance that just follows grammatical uh, stuff. And I did, I did a, because uh, I converted it to Hebrew, which is, Hebrew's anihu. This is egoi me. I, I converted it to the Hebrew uh, anihu. And I, I looked at all the references. Who calls himself the great I am of the Old Testament? Every single time, with one exception, it was God Almighty. Who did Jesus just say he was? Uh, I finally arrived. I am the I am of all time and space. I'm outside of time and space. I created cause and effect. I, I'm God. What did they try to do after this? Stone him. Why? For blasphemy. 
They knew exactly what he said. But they should have known who he was because, because all their prophets were saying, the Son of God is coming. And indeed, he was there. You know, when you, when you talk about the gospel of God, it's wrapped up in the person of Jesus. He is the Son of God, and only God could come pay for the sin of man and redeem us by defeating sin and death. That's transformative. And then he talks not just about the person of the gospel, he talks about the person, the person of the gospel. Then he talks about the power of the gospel. And we'll close with this. What's he say here about the, the purpose of the gospel? Well, if you just had to break it down in its base form to explain somebody the gospel, this is really short. You could just say the purpose of the gospel is to redeem people. This is to save them. It's the good news. He's a savior and they need salvation. What does Paul say here? Well, he says here in this passage, uh, this one, Jesus, uh, who's the son of God, he's the one who was born of the descendant of David. And then he's going to add, according to the flesh. Why is he talking about that when he's talking about the gospel? Uh, it's pretty simple. God had promised David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would give him a covenant that was eternal. An eternal covenant with an eternal king who would reign and rule over a, an empire that was eternal the only way that the, the king could be eternal, based on 2 Samuel 7, is for God to come and be the Davidic king. So not only do we know that God was going to come and be the savior of the gospel for mankind, he's going to come through a specific family line, the line of David, the tribe of Judah, the Davidic line, to fulfill 2 Samuel chapter 7. In the book of Jeremiah, and you can read 2 Samuel 7 on your own, where God promises an eternal priesthood, a kingdom. And by the way, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying for the kingdom to come, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Come from where? From heaven to earth. What kingdom is that? The Davidic kingdom promised to David. To have an eternal kingdom, you need an eternal king. Now, he never said, I'm going to put somebody on David's throne until the Messiah appears. He just says, your empire will be perpetual, but one's coming one day who will rule and reign over it forever. That will be the Messiah, Jesus. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, Jeremiah is getting ready for the nation to be defeated by the Babylonians because of their rejection of God. In chapter 23, uh, many years after uh, Isaiah prophesied and Micah, he writes these words to the Israelites concerning their messed up political and religious leaders. Notice what he says. It says, what are the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture? Declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you in your evil deeds. That happened in 609 when they were invaded. Then I myself shall gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I've driven them, and I shall bring them back to their pasture, and they'll be fruitful and multiply. If you remember Israel's history, in 722 B.C., the ten tribes were carried into captivity, oblivion, by Tiglath-Pileser III, the Assyrian warlord. God says, I, in the future, I'm going to regather those lost people. He says, I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend to them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. And, his, and in his days, when he arrives, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely in his name. And what's the name we will call this one that will come from the line of David? He identifies him. The Lord, Yahweh, our righteousness. That's the Messiah. Who is he? He's the Lord. He's the Lord. He was prophesied to come from the line of David to be the king of kings. What does our old world need right now more than that? The king to show up. And the king shall show up. And he will bring justice and righteousness and holiness. And he will be here and we will be excited to see him. But the question is, the only way you're going to see him when the king arrives is you've got to be transformed. How do you get transformed? You've got to step into the salvation chamber. Remember? And say, God, I'm a sinner. I, I, need, I need to be saved. Only he the Son of God can save you. When I was in college uh, at Azusa Pacific University back in the uh, 70, I don't know, 76 to 80, um, I joined Mel Corral, 50 men. Uh, and we toured all over the place, up and down the uh, Oregon, Washington, California. And we did concerts every weekend uh, in churches in L.A. I think I've seen every church in L.A. Um, 50 men in blue suits with baby blue ties, three-piece suits, it was the 70s, go with it. And before the concerts, uh, we would get behind the stage as the people were streaming in, 
This is a big thing because we did acapella numbers and all. I mean, the Lord's Prayer acapella was moving. But we'd get bit together and form a giant circle. And I was a second tenor, so you'd get with your group. And we'd all stand together, uh, shoulder to shoulder, staring at each other. And we would sing, And Can It Be? And Can It Be, that old hymn. Guys would cry as we would sing. Young men. We were 18, 20 years old. Guys would cry because we would, it was worship. And we all understood that that Savior had died for the likes of us. And we could not save ourselves. I'll never forget the verse that goes like this. He left his Father's throne above so free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself all but of love. And he bled for Adam's helpless race. That'd be me. That'd be you. Tis mercy all immense and free for, oh my God, it found out me. And I love this part, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst do what? Die for me. Die for me. We would go into concerts worshiping as we went in as young men, knowing it was all about the gospel of Christ. Do you know the Savior? Well, they found you, and have you found him? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the credentials of Paul. Uh, so eloquent is the way that he writes, so deep are his words, so simple they are in other ways that a child can understand them. Those among us who do not know the transforming power of the gospel, might they go to a counselor off to my left today and say, I, I want to be saved today. And uh, may you redeem them as you promised that you would and, and give them spiritual life for all time as you've promised. And we thank you for the gospel you've given us. Might we be brave and courageous with it and loving as we dispense it to those about us in the name of Christ, amen.